Today I'm going to talk about miracles and God's actions, and how miracles aren't God's only actions. Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. This topic actually came up in conversation with my nine-year-old son not that long ago, and um, it, it was, it was uh, it's actually, by the way, incidentally really cool because it gave me a chance to explain some really neat stuff. And, and then it occurred to me that you don't see this talked about uh, a great deal, so I just wanted to share it. Um, so uh, a habit a lot of people have is to talk about God's actions as if miracles are the only direct actions of God. And, um, and so I, like the way my son had phrased it was something about like, you know, you know, after creating the universe, God didn't do a lot within history, you know, some things, but, but not a lot. And it's a common thing because it's drawn from the metaphor. Human beings, when we do something in the world, we do it by interfering. Because we are creatures co-equal with the other creatures around us, like air and gravity, you know, air and matter and gravity and time and space and all these other creatures, um, you know, protons, neutrons, electrons, etc. You know, all these these creatures in creation, or thing, creature being a thing that is created. Um, all these creatures we are co-equal with. We, we exist within the same time and space as them, and we influence each other. But we can exist without them, and they can exist without us. And so... Um, they don't depend upon us in any way. And so when we change them, we do so from the outside. And so, you know, like, so if I'm, you know, if I'm making something, like if I'm making a curtain rod, I take a, you know, I, I buy a dowel from the store. I interfere with it by transporting it from the store to my house. I interfere with it by taking my saw and cutting the thing to the correct length. I interfere with it by, um, you know, putting it into, you know, uh, details aside, screwing it into, you know, the place where I'm putting the curtain rod. I interfere with it by hanging curtains on it. I am changing it from the outside. I'm interfering with it. And the only way that I'm doing anything with it is by interfering with it. If I read a book, I interfere with it by moving the pages around and looking at it and so on. Um, in all cases, my actions are interfering with something that would happily continue existing on its own um, without any reference to me, unless I come and intrude upon its existence. This, however, is not at all God's interaction with the world. So, for example, when you walk down the street, you um, this depends upon things like there being a street. The street depends upon their thing, uh, upon things like there being rocks, like there being protons, neutrons, and electrons, like the rock being on top of big, thick plates that are you know floating on top of the magma around the core of the earth this depends upon gravity being not too high and not too small and you know even in more particular ways you know some of those are general but some of them are fairly particular like like there being a street here in the place where you're walking down the street is largely governed by the shape of where the the surface rocks are that we, you know we don't build you know if you've got two hills we don't build a um a road going, you know, straight across them. We, we do not like to tunnel through hills. We have a strong tendency to go around these things. We have a strong tendency to build the stuff where there are rivers. Now, the fact that there is a river here and there are hills here such that this is the sort of place that human beings will build a road is itself part of God's action because like all of these things, when God set up the way the world worked in its starting condition, Part of how he was doing this is taking into account at every moment the way everything interacts with everything. Because, of course, time being a creature and God being outside of time, all moments of time exist to God. And so, at, um, at all moments of time, the initial conditions of the universe and their interaction with every single moment is something that is present to God as he's creating the initial conditions. And so, the fact that there is a street here at all, the fact that there were people to build this street, that there are people here to build the street at the appropriate time. These things are all part of God's design as you are walking down the street. And so you walking down the street is one of the manifold purposes of all of the things that um, there being a street there at all for you to walk on are contingent upon. And so, you know, when you take a board and a nail and a hammer, the fact that these things actually exist, that you could buy them, that they were there, that you had the money to do it, all of these things are contingent on stuff that goes so far back you can't see it, but are all completely present to God. So that 
when you say that, like, that, you know, like, okay, but like, you know, God didn't like specially like miracle up the board. No, he didn't miracle up the board. He created nature in such a way that this board was naturally here. That is no less part of the direct action of God, and that is no less God's intentional action than would miraculously making a board there be. It's just that God's, cre you know, one of the main themes of creation, if you look, sorry about hitting the microphone there. Um, one of God's great themes in creation seems to be that of delegation. That God could do things directly, but gives it to us to be those actions. Like a, one of my favorite examples is like feeding the hungry. That when you give food to the hungry, God could make that person not even need food. God could make them in such a way that they don't require food in the least. God could directly give that person food, but instead God gives it to you to have food to give to that person so that you can be part of God's act of giving that person being, of giving that person life. And so God is still giving it to that person through you, but you, because you are given to intermediate this, become part of God's love to that person. And so in this way, through this act of delegation, God is actually incorporating us into his act of love. God is actually incorporating us into himself in this way, because God is love, after all. Um, love in the sense of the, the generous act, the act of generosity, of, of um, desiring the good, willing the good of the other for the sake of the other. Um, th that sort of love, not, not feelings, but rather the, the willing of the good. Um, and so that act of delegation doesn't make the God's giving of life to that person any less God's action just because he also gave it to you to be part of this action. And so when you look at the world, there's a sense in which there really isn't such a thing as a miracle, um, in that everything is miraculous, and if everything is miraculous, then nothing is, um, because miracle really means an exception, and everything is actually an exception to non- everything that is is an exception to the, to the non-existence that would exist apart from God, so everything in that sense is miraculous and therefore an exception. There is a useful sense in which you can um, se uh, separate nature from um, from the miraculous and the, the exceptions to how nature goes. Um, so I don't mean entirely to deny it, but it's a, um, a more, much more academic distinction because everything that happens is part of God's special act of creation and is all entirely intentional on the part of God. That everything, er, everything that's there, everything that gives you being, everything that sustains you in the moment, everything that enables you to do anything is there because God willed it, and God very intentionally willed it, because in every moment that you can use any of this stuff, its natural existence here is dependent upon the way that God created the world, such that this stuff would come to naturally exist there. And so it really is the wrong way of looking at it to, to look at the world and think that, like, you know, God sort of just set it up and then lets it go and isn't really doing very much of anything, because God's doing all of it. And a really useful metaphor here is that of a novel. Now, um, you know, when, um, oh, let's see, when, uh, uh, when Hamlet says a rat and draws a sword and stabs into the curtain, would it be correct to say that, like, um, that, that Shakespeare just kind of, like, wrote the title, you know, The Tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, and then, like, you know, there was just... Things were following their course, their drapes. Hamlet had a sword, so he just, you know, drew it and stabbed it. And, like, you know, Shakespeare wasn't really involved in that. No, that'd be nonsense. Because the only reason Hamlet even had a sword at hand to draw was because Shakespeare wrote that sword into the play. The only reason that anything was around there, the only reason that that when, um, um, uh, when, uh, you know, um, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are given the letters to, um, you know, that, that are supposed to say to, um, to kill Hamlet and Hamlet changes them to say, to, to, you know, say, uh, to kill Rosencrantz and Guildenstern instead, like, it doesn't make any sense to say like, oh, well, yeah, but I mean like, you know, he just used paper and paper existed because it's part of the natural world and Shakespeare didn't do anything. Like the paper's not there because of Shakespeare. The paper's there because like somebody had made it. Well, no. That paper very much is there because of Shakespeare. Now, if it came up, Shakespeare would have described somebody as having made the paper. He, Shakespeare would not. It's not the kind of play where Shakespeare would say, like, and paper suddenly popped into existence because I, Shakespeare, wrote it there. You wouldn't find that in the play. Shakespeare would describe 
you know, some human being making the paper that, that uh, Hamlet wrote upon. But the mere fact that there be a human being within the story who wrote on the paper in no way means that it's not there because of Shakespeare. And it's not like Shakespeare simply wrote the title and then, like, the thing kept on going. It literally, not a single aspect of this story exists without Shakespeare writing it. So Shakespeare, it is all very present to Shakespeare as Shakespeare is writing this stuff out. So, um, no, I mean, it's an imperfect, humans are imperfect. We have, you know, finite memory, not every moment, etc. But like you, you can, it's actually very helpful because, you know, we can revise things and, you know, you can flip back several pages and read what's exactly there and you can even, you know, change things. And so, you know, it's, it's a, a rough metaphor, but it's a surprisingly good one. You can't push it too far, like any metaphor, but it's a surprisingly good one. And so if you want to get a sense, the beginning of the sense, of how everything is in God's intention, and how our entire life is lived, suffused by God's intentionality, and how every time you take a sip of water, this is God giving you a sip of water, thinking of something like Shakespeare writing Hamlet is a good place to start, because not a single thing happens without, in, in one of Shakespeare's plays, without Shakespeare writing it. And in that same way, not a single thing happens within creation without God creating it and creating it intentionally and understanding. Now, now God, being so much more than human beings, understands the interactions of everything with everything throughout all of creation, uh, all simultaneously. God doesn't have problems like having to remember something because God, you know, Shakespeare writes the play in time where he's writing one word and then he writes another word and he's not writing the first word while he's writing the second word so you know it's a big place where it breaks down um but at the same time you can really see that how the really correct way of viewing things is how the entirety of the world is in every moment in every detail vividly being cre being created by god in that moment, in the full knowledge of all of its implications, both in its moment and on all subsequent moments, such that everything is really, when you get down to it, um, you know, within the intention of God, and moreover, everything that happens is within the intention. I don't. Um, there's a very useful um, uh, sense to describe. Um, God's, uh, you know, active will versus permissive will, by the way. Um, so that, you know, God actively wills that we make choices, but he wills that we, it, it is God's will for us that we choose virtue, but we are capable of choosing sin and God permits us to choose sin. Um, but even in that choosing of sin, God knows the implications of everything and works out the entirety of creation, such that the what we are capable of doing and the evil we can accomplish, is properly circumscribed, so that um, so that everything that happens still falls within the good will of God, such that everything is every creature is taken care of and given that measure that God wishes to give to it. So, uh, um, you know, like um, when when a person murders another. Um, they are, in one sense, cutting that person's life short. But in another sense, they are not cutting it short in the sense of frustrating God's good purposes. Because if God intended to give the person more life, you know, more moments of existence, because we all have a finite amount of time within this world as the world's unfolding. And then, you know, we, we move on after this temporary world in, into the permanent world of eternity. But, you know, we all have a, a temporary time within the temporary world. And so, however many moments we are given, it's not like God was really wanted to give more moments, but simply couldn't make it happen because of what somebody else did. Because, uh, and, and to just show you what I mean, there's such a thing as attempted murder, where people try to murder people but fail. Our success or failure at all the things we do is outside of our control, but very much within God's control. And so, God works, uh, God sets up the world such that even when we fail at being good, even when we choose um, choose evil over good, we don't achieve what we intend, but we will still work to God's good purposes because God controls all of the circumstances. If you try to shoot somebody, God controls whether or not the gun will go off or whether um, the gun will seize. God, God controls how good your aim is in the moment and all the various other things 
um, within the moment that are really outside of your control that govern your success or a failure. Um, you know, and, and it's really struck um, in the Gospels. There, there are a number of occasions, um, but, but like a, we're, we're like um, one that comes to mind uh, just in the moment. It suffices because there, there are several others. Um, but where the uh, mob was angry at Jesus and took him to a cliff to throw him off. But it wasn't his hour, so he just slipped by them and walked away. And so they tried to murder him, but, you know, it wasn't time for him to be murdered yet. And so he wasn't. And they just didn't succeed. And that's the way things frequently happen. If you look at people trying to commit evil, they succeed sometimes and they fail at others. And when do they succeed and when do they fail? And this is how you can see the permissive will of God. And how, like, if a person murders another, he is at fault for it. He is deforming his own soul. But at the same time, his success or failure is beyond his own control. And if um, he comes to kill a person in an unnatural way, um, through his sin, he may still be serving the good purposes of God, who only intended to give so many moments to that person anyway, and that person had come to the end of his life, and the end of his life is supposed to happen, you know, would have happened in some other way had the person not chosen, um, you know, not chosen to sin, but it is still, in choosing to sin, he is being allowed to succeed because it is time for that person's life to draw to a close because, as I said, we all get a finite amount of time and we don't know how long that is and for that person that was the finite amount of time that they'd been given. And then they move on from there to eternity and, and you know, um, assuming they're, you know, um, assuming that they accept, you know, God's offer of salvation and eternity of happiness with God. So, um, that's... That's kind of the thing, and you can see this, by the way, actually, and uh, I'll sort of use this uh, just in closing. Um, there's this, uh, I never read Marlowe's Faust, a friend of mine did, and told me about this wonderful scene in it where um, the uh, Mephisto, or, I'm sorry, Mephistopheles, not Mephisto, sorry, um, Mephistopheles, the, the demon, comes to Faustus, Dr. Faustus, and because um, Dr. Faustus wants to learn the forbidden secrets of, of, of the world. And um, Mephistopheles, uh, you know, she tries to summon a, an earth spirit, and the earth spirit's like, nah, but there's someone who'll, who's coming, will talk to you. And, um, and that's Mephistopheles. And, uh, and he ident identifies himself. And, um, um, and, he, and he, Faustus asks him who he is, and he describes, I'm he who always seeks to do evil and always works good. And this is something he holds very much against God, that no matter how much he tries to ruin things, he always ends up actually work making them better according to God's plan. He actually ends up carrying out God's plan, no matter how much he's actually trying to frustrate God's plan. It's one of the things he really holds against God, is the fact that he's never permitted to actually make things worse. Um, that, like, in the moment within the clouded vision, it can look like he's accomplishing things to become worse, but then they always turn out to actually work out for the best. And so... Um, Mephistopheles really, really holds this against God that he's not allowed to actually accomplish evil, that he tries and tries and tries to make things worse, and he never actually succeeds in making anything worse. It only looks like it for the moment because within his limited understanding, but then he, he comes to see outside of his limited understanding that actually in the bigger picture, it actually worked out for the best, and, and he shakes his metaphorical fist against God. Um, and this is approximately in the same exchange um, where Faustus asks him, like, well, if you're a devil, then why aren't you in hell? And he replies, this is hell, and nor am I out of it. Uh, and goes on to explain that, that um, hell isn't a location, it's a state of rebellion against God. And he's very much in rebellion against God and hating every moment of it. Um, that, that every moment of his existence is torture because it's not actually possible to escape from God, no matter how much he actually wants to. It's not actually possible to achieve making the world worse because God won't let him and twists everything Mephistopheles does to bring good out of the evil Mephistopheles is trying to achieve. And, um, you know, it's, it's obviously fiction, but fiction's very useful because fiction tends to condense reality into intelligible ways, which is why it can be so useful, um, uh, you know, for purposes of illustration. Not very good in, in the way of evidence to some conclusion, but wonderful for illustration of a concept. And that's how I'm using it, just this illustration for a concept. So that's the thing. If you look at the world, and you look at the world properly, the hand of God is literally everywhere. There is nothing that is outside of God's intention. 
in some way or other. And essentially, we all of us, all creatures, great and small, from, you know, electrons up to human beings, up to angels, you know, the, the hierarchy of created things, um, we all of us will serve God's good purposes. The only open question for those of us who have free will is whether we will do so intentionally or not. But we all serve God's good purposes. And everything that happens is according to God's good purposes. Just mostly beyond our understanding. Until next time, may you hit everything you aim at. If you like this video, then clicking the like button, according to YouTube, will make them more likely to recommend it to others. If you know anyone who might get something out of this video, then it would be kind to share it with them, or just share it on social media in general. And if you'd like to see future videos of mine, you can subscribe. And uh, if you're not in the habit of checking your subscriptions page regularly, then I suggest clicking the notification bell and setting that to always, because otherwise uh, subscribing to a channel basically just sort of like gives YouTube a hint that maybe it should consider recommending these videos to you, possibly at some point, if they think so. It's a funny world we live in. God bless.